Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Bob the Booker and today I really want to focus on one of the Booker Prize icons um, of our times, Julian Barnes, uh, today being his birthday. Now Julian Barnes is no stranger to the Booker Prize having won it in 2011 and having been nominated three other times and I really just wanted to speak about this author and the, the power in my mind of Julian Barnes's writing. Um, he is a writer who I have so much time for and have thoroughly enjoyed in so, so many ways. I really need to go back and read more of his back catalogue. So starting with his first Booker Prize nomination in 1984 with Flaubert's Parrot. Um, I really enjoyed this book and it's such a weird and wonderful ride in my mind. It's such a different kind of book for the um for, for the shortlist you know alongside kind of some fairly regular standard fiction that's very exciting in its own way here is a book that almost feels like it's literary criticism turned into a novel um so the whole book focuses around this one character's quest to um track down a bit more information about par the parrot owned by gustave flaubert the writer and in doing so, we get all of these insights into Flaubert's life and into the life of this academic who's really looking into him um, and his own relationship uh, with his wife, who is kind of quite a bit confused about all of this going on. Um, for me, this is such a wonderful and imaginative piece of work. Um, I can totally see why this would not appeal to some people. Absolutely fine. It's a bit of a weird one. But for me, I think as always, Julian Barnes's writing holds it together. Um, and this is kind of a theme I'm going to come on to a little bit uh, anyway. But sometimes his ideas don't necessarily land with me, but I can't help but love the way they're written. Um, for me, uh, Flaubert's Parrot is so bizarre. Um, at one point, we get an A to Z of Flaubert's life, um, including talking about um, sexually transmitted diseases and um, his loves and his foibles and quirks and all of those kinds of things. It's bizarre um, and a really, really quick read, but just so brilliant. Um, I think this is uh, why he's kind of one of those writers who is sort of so beloved because he is so clever and thought through with all of his ideas. There is often a multi-layered approach to so many of these themes. It's not just as simple as we're writing about Flaubert, but there has to be this kind of mirrored life of, you know, what does it mean to be someone looking into someone, to an author's life? And this coming obviously as well from an author, I think is really exciting. It reminds me a bit of Curtsy um, writing his um, autobiography, as it were, as fiction. Um, which I think is quite exciting. Um, so yeah, this I, I just think is a brilliant little book and uh, is well worth checking out. And so um, around the time that he wrote Flaubert's Parrot, uh, Barnes was seen as kind of a really up and coming writer who was really starting to come into his power. And it's really interesting actually, because the grantor list around that time of up and coming British authors included Kazuo Shigeru, uh, Salman Rushdie, um, Julian Barnes obviously and when you think about those and in McEwen and when you think about some of those authors now they have such a big impact on how we sort of see literature um, and particularly British literature and they are you know sort of real sort of members of this sort of establishment of, of beautiful British fiction um, and it's really great to see how those authors have kind of blossomed over their careers and it's also just really weird to think of a, a new and emerging Julian Barnes now because for me he is just one of those writers who's kind of always been there um, and I'm deeply deeply excited about his work but his second nomination came a little bit later in 1998 so a good 14 years after his previous one and this time he was shortlisted for England England um, so this is a really quite bizarre madcap story in some ways um, and again like I said even if I didn't necessarily connect with the idea of the story, I am still there for the ride because of Julian Barnes's writing. Um, his writing is always very sharp and astute, sometimes acerbic. Um, he's got a real sense of characters' voices and motivations. Um, and he's very good at painting these characters who are, for the most part, really unlikable, but you kind of like to dislike them and also know that they're just a bit flawed and a bit failed. Um, and England, England has plenty of those. So the whole idea about it is that with England as it is, um, or the UK rather, 
it's kind of it's this idea of sort of post empire or sort of late civilization so england has kind of exhausted um, who it is as a modern player in the world and so england now has to rebrand itself but obviously you know the, the england that so many tourists come to visit particularly with the uk more generally but this does focus on england um the whole idea around it is you know we've got all of these big kind of treasures and um landmarks and things that people come to see you know they want to know about british history uh things like the tudors things like shakespeare all of these um kind of moments that are so known um I, you know it's almost what the audience expects if they come to the uk um for on holiday you know stonehenge all the kind of typical british things and the idea is then kind of brought to you know it follows this idea that um has been sort of made before which is that in theory all of the people all of the the population of um of england could fit onto the isle of wight um which is sort of based more on the sort of size more generally of like standing side by side obviously not a very comfortable um <laughs> way to be uh, but it kind of marries those two ideas together and basically turns the isle of wight into a british theme park or an english theme park i should say which is basically uh you know in the small space of the isle of wight seeing absolutely everything that england has to offer um, including all of its replicas of like stonehenge of uh, hampton court of everything uh british oh, everything english i should say i keep on saying british um and that's actually part of where the difficulty lies in this story um because there are so many myths and legends that people want to use and, and bring up in england uh from from english history that people keep on realizing oh actually that's welsh or he was scottish or you know she was from from ireland originally um and that kind of really complicates this idea and so basically they turn the uk um and its history and particularly english history into a theme park on the isle of wight however what then happens is the isle of wight uh is sort of essentially rebranded as england england and it breaks away from england and from the uk and so now you've got this really weird scenario where if a tourist is coming do they go to uh england england and basically see all of the sites of uh, the uk all of its history all of that kind of stuff but all right next to each other um or do they go to the real thing which is now kind of in decay and crumbling um you know is the replica better than the real thing and there's a lot of these kind of discussions and what's also really interesting about that is this idea of which i think is really clever and this is where julian barnes's mastery comes in is this idea then of what it means to sell your culture or sell your history or sell a story of who you are um, and so this idea that England can be boiled down to Shakespeare and Robin Hood and Stonehenge and all of these things uh, basically consumerizes uh, and uh, the, the uh, England England and its history and so suddenly um, it's the idea of like do you is the experience of going to a country seeing the real thing or is it okay to see replicas because really ultimately you're paying for that feeling of having been there even if it wasn't necessarily the real thing i found this really interesting on a personal note as well um from when i lived in china for just under a year and it was quite common there um or in some parts i should say for for example if you um so at one point i climbed a mountain with the school um that i worked with like not like climbing climbing but like up steps and uh you know for several hours and once we got to the top of the um of the mountain what i thought was really interesting was that there was like a little stall that was selling um basically green screen photoshopping opportunities to pretend you're on the great wall so for example i you know if if i did it for example it would have been going and posing in a certain way and then they would create a picture of me on the great wall of china that would look realistic enough that i could tell people that i'd been to the great wall of china um interestingly i'd already been to the great wall of china by that point so it didn't necessarily appeal anyway but i found that idea really strange and really interesting that what does it mean to say that you've been somewhere like um if you know i'm intrigued by those people who would have bought those pictures do they tell people oh yeah this is just photoshop this is not the real thing i just thought it was really funny or do they tell everybody that they've been there um, and I was really fascinated by that. And that came up a lot in my mind while I was uh, reading England, England. 
Um, for me, the story didn't necessarily, you know, I, I, kind of towards the end, I was a bit like, okay, I feel like this point's sort of been made, but I did think it was really interesting, this idea of consumerism and selling your culture and selling your country, um, and particularly, therefore, what that means kind of in terms of other countries because you know when we think about certain countries we have certain expectations again when I lived abroad um, both in China and in South Korea people would sort of expect me to have seen and done everything British right so I've never been to Stonehenge for example I've still not even been to Oxford um, and so when people would sort of ask particularly at the time when I hadn't been to even even more things in the UK um, there was this expectation that surely in such a small country I would have gone to all of those places and I would have done everything because that's what you do like you know you're a British person surely you dress like a dandy every day go and get fish and chips every day you go and do these things and there's such weird stereotypical cultural markers um, and I found that fascinating um, and England England really delves into that the fact that you know I found on the flip side when I was in China I was like well of course I need to go to the Great Wall of course I need to do this um, same in South Korea like there was a real understanding that there were certain things that I should be doing or seeing you know travel guides almost always have those lists of 20 or 30 or more things that you should do and see and so many of them seem to fit certain stereotypes right like things that the average person might not do every day so um, you go to you go to China yes of course you're going to go to the great wall you're going to climb this certain mountain you're going to see the state um opera or ballet you're going to see this other cultural kind of thing you know you go to france you're going to go to a vineyard or you're going to see the eiffel tower um, and that fascinates me and i think england england is really clever in that respect that it really sells this idea and for me that's again why julian barnes is such an interesting author because he's really delved into some of those ideas um of what it means to, to kind of have a country what is a country what are these myths and even in the book we see people creating new myths entirely and selling them and you know you've got people pretending you know sort of essentially paid actors who are full-time um you know characters from robin hood stories or kind of they are peasants from a certain time really interesting kind of things like that so yeah again Gillian barnes is such a weird creative force and i love that i think every book of his that i've read has just been so tonally and thematically different uh, with such different ideas coming in and i think that's what makes him such a fun author to pick up you never quite know what you're going to get and then again, uh, in 2005, Julian Barnes was shortlisted for a third time, this time with his book, Arthur and George. Now I've spoken about this at length <laughs> in my 2005 video, uh, but Arthur and George is all about um, the, these two men, one being Arthur Conan Doyle, um, writer of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, and again, actually interestingly, also you know, another sort of British, um, Kind of a part of British history that people want to explore when they come here, uh, you know, come to the UK to visit. You know, I know that when I've shown people around London before, they've really wanted to go and see Baker Street um, and kind of see, you know, these kind of cultural monuments and moments. Um, and it's Arthur's uh, kind of growing friendship with this man who has been accused of, um, of decapitating horses and other kind of violent crimes. And what's so interesting is these two kind of men going alongside each other in sort of Victorian England. Um, it's so well painted in my mind and it's really like this beautiful attention to details. He's a very sensitive writer, I find, not only in the sense of senses of emotions, um, but also very, very sensual. Um, you feel like you can touch and feel most things in his books and that's what I really love about it. Um, Arthur and George I just think is, is fantastic as well for just telling a really good story. It's um, again a lot of Julian Barnes's references are very are quite literary you know we saw with Flaubert's Parrot about obviously Flaubert. Um, here we get this whole idea of writing a crime detective-ish story um, about Arthur Conan Doyle instead of Sherlock Holmes and so Arthur Conan Doyle is essentially Sherlock Holmes in his own book um, which I think is really clever um, and sometimes Julian Barnes does that thing where you're like oh you're a little bit too clever for me <laughs> when you're reading it and you're like oh gosh didn't actually quite catch that or maybe you know I'm not sure if I needed that bit personally but again I just I he's such an exciting writer for me and I'm always quite intrigued by what he's going to come up with next um, but yes, and that obviously then marked three times that he had been shortlisted and hadn't won. Which brings us to 2011, when Julian Barnes finally wins a Booker Prize. And I say finally as if he's owed one, but 
it's strange and interesting for me that you know the, this kind of granter uh, writers kind of at the time of these sort of new incoming British writers there was a real moment where you know they kind of captured the zeitgeist and there were these really popular innovative exciting voices and uh, the Booker Prize um, always it's kind of interesting all of them pretty much all of those writers had their time of winning the Booker Prize eventually so Ian McEwan did so, so did Salman Rushdie um, and you know you've just got all of these oh hello I've got my cat here again hello um, there we go wave your tail for everyone um, and uh, what was really exciting for me was just that um, Julian Barnes winning in 2011 was just so right almost as a, an acknowledgement of all of his other incredible work but for me sense of an ending is such an incredible book it's something i adore and i remember reading it um probably not long after it came out and there'd been a lot of buzz about it and i didn't really know much about it and i remember reading it it's short it's probably about 150 to 200 pages and you get to the end and you're like hang on what <laughs> because right at the end he throws something at you uh, a twist that you weren't really ready for um, and what's really exciting about that for me is that the book you can almost immediately reread it. Julian Barnes didn't give away what he saw as being the real um, ending, particularly uh, or, the, or the real kind of understanding behind the ending. And obviously, the title is very clever in that sense. But what for me really works about this about that book is it um, it's so sort of full of secrets and mystery, but ultimately it's all there. Um, so. Julian Barnes, in an interview speaking about the Booker Prize um, win at the time, said, you know, I, uh, I kind of, I've kind of given you value for money because for seven pounds, you get a book that you read twice. Um, and I thought that was really clever. It's kind of, you know, people were sort of saying it's not a, like he kind of said himself, sorry, it's not a 150 page novel. It's a 300 page novel. You just happen to read it twice. And I love that. For me, that's what's so clever about it. Because when you reread it, and you know, I listened to it on audiobook recently again, I thought I'd remembered so many details about it, but it's so intricate and dense. Um, I also, as some of you have sort of said a bit in some videos before, I have a real soft spot for stories that are all about memory and the failings of memory, and particularly um, unreliable narrators in terms of their memory. So characters who've either forgotten something or have a really strong bias, which meant that they didn't interpret something in a certain way, or even as we see in a sense of an ending, a character who doesn't really want to see the truth um, and is so sort of pig-headed, um, oh, there she goes, uh, so pig-headed in his own way that he doesn't um, see what's happening in front of him. So we as, as, a, as the reader, get there a lot sooner than he does and we're so angry and frustrated at him because he doesn't get there he doesn't understand what everybody else around him is saying um obviously with the booker prize as well it helps if you have a book that lends itself naturally to rereading uh because if you make it to the long list you're reread to get the shortlist then the shortlist is reread to get the winner and so books that do very very well on multiple readings um tend to do quite well in a prize um however all that said i mean julian barnes in this novel i just think is absolutely the height of his powers it's so tightly done there is not almost a word that's unnecessary in this book for me um i know some people have a bit of a mixed reaction to it and that's fair for me i just think it's so genius that it's it's tense and tight all the way through you really don't like the character who's narrating to you you don't think you know he, he is horrible to characters particularly women and you kind of all the way through hate him for that but at the same time you recognize that all the women who are saying various things particularly the women are sidelined and not listened to at his peril he misses so many details because he's so pig-headed and, and doesn't want to listen but I think just those four books alone and some others I read of it, it was Metroland I read, which is his first novel, I didn't necessarily love, but it has some really good, interesting things going on in it as well. Um, but Julian Barnes is just such an interesting and exciting writer for me. He is always challenging himself to come up with new thoughts, new ideas, approaching things from entirely different angles, um, you know, to have the same author write Flaubert's Parrot and Arthur and George and England England and A Sense of an Ending is kind of baffling. Those are very very different books in many ways 
Um, and I think it's just, uh, you know, testament to his mastery that he's able to jump between them so cleverly and so well. So anyway, this has just been me gushing about Julian Barnes for a really long time, uh, but I really hope you go and check him out. Um, if you've read any other books of his uh, that you think I should check out that I haven't mentioned here today, I would love to hear about them. I am making it a sort of personal project of mine to go and read his back catalogue, just because I've very rarely been disappointed uh, by his work. Um, really hope that you uh, enjoy Julian Barnes as well um, on this, his birthday, and take care and enjoy your reading. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.